Hi, I am Justin Paperni with White Collar Advice. It's good to be back with you and back on YouTube. I think it's been five or six weeks since I filmed the video, but I have good reason. And the answer to why well, actually comes from a question I received a couple of days ago. Someone who watched my video asked me where the normal paintings or pictures I had behind me that I used to have in my office in most of uh, my, my videos. And I responded and told him, as I tell you, that I had to replace those with my old USC baseball jersey, as I love to relive the glory days from 20 years ago, because those paintings had been moved upstairs because my wife and I had a little boy. His name is Jason, born May 29th, uh, and those paintings were in my office, excuse me, in my, my room growing up when I was born, and now they're in my son's room. So they've been relocated, and to fill out the wall and live the glory days, my USC jersey uh, is behind me. It has been a busy time, welcoming a new baby. Thankfully, my wife is phenomenal and awesome and enduring a lot of long nights and to the extent that I can help I certainly am uh, but it does feel to, good to get back back to work so to speak and contributing content that I hope you find valuable. Uh, while adjusting back to work um, I want to share a story with you that June 22nd you know last month I even feel rusty doing this video June 22nd uh, last month I contributed to two conferences um, at the Fairmont Hotel in Santa Monica for the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. The first conference I had the privilege of sharing the panel with some of the top defense attorneys in the country with a phenomenal federal public defender out of uh, New Mexico and I shared my insights on mitigation, um, insights of a you know, former defendant and someone whose companies work with more than a thousand white collar defendants over the last decade. So we had the lawyer's perspective and the consultant's perspective as we taught and addressed um, you know, lawyers in the audience. So it was, I think, a productive session. In the afternoon, uh, I trained or contributed to the training of federal public defenders, and I also had the privilege of speaking with Judge Benita Pearson from Ohio. And that's, I wanna share some of her sentiments from uh, our presentation. I'm going to jump right in specifically. She said to us and to all the lawyers in the audience during our presentation, your job as the lawyer is to make us as smart as you possibly can about your client. If you've missed the opportunity, you've missed it. And I want you to think about that. As you're preparing for sentencing, um, are you doing everything you absolutely can to convey to the judge why you're worthy of mercy? During my presentation with Judge Pearson, I referenced a comment that Judge Boo made in a video that Michael Santos filmed with him where he said, this was a little uncomfortable to say in front of a room full of lawyers, but I'm always going to speak openly. Judge Pearson said about 2% of what influences him at sentencing comes from lawyers. Maybe I'll stop this video and put up that specific segment um, in this video. 2%, which means the balance comes from the defendant, from you from your mitigation efforts. So that includes character reference letters and compelling narratives and volunteer work and working. I shared the story at sentencing of a client who went to it. I shared a story at this conference of a client who went to an Ivy League school who drove for Uber. And we used some of those Uber reviews and it impressed the judge because the judge knew of his background but saw that he wanted to build a new record as a law-abiding citizen, that he was willing to humble himself to work because it was better than sitting at home all day. Are you willing to do whatever it takes? It's one thing to say it, it's another thing to do it. Judge Pearson also said at the end of a sentencing, you should be tired knowing you've left it all out there. And she was speaking both to the defendant and the lawyer. You should be exhausted at the end of that sentencing, she said, because leading up to that sentencing, you need to be working. You need to be creating a new record and demonstrating through your own efforts why you're worthy of the best outcome. Judges are going to know I asked her in front of everyone, is it true that I heard in prison or is it your opinion that perhaps some judges don't read letters or perhaps the letters are too long and they're not going to be read? I'm talking about narratives and character reference letters and because I heard that every day in jail. I hear it now, Justin, I'm not going to write a letter. The judge isn't going to read it. It's a waste of time. It's a formality. This is a conservative judge that's been doing it for 30 years. Nothing's going to move the needle. And if that's the case, you shouldn't bother watching this video or following or opting in to get our free training resources because if you're going to default to there's nothing I can do, well, then you're not going to do anything. Uh, I mean, th there's this unique commonality between a pessimist and an optimist. A pessimist says nothing matters. An optimist says everything's going to work out. So you know, what's the point? Everything's going to work out. So in both cases, neither may work. So too much pessimism and too much optimism are really not good things. I'm of the opinion that you need to work, and Judge Pearson confirmed exactly that. You should be exhausted at your sentencing because it should be a full-time job. And anyone that's going to work with us, and if you were to speak with any client, and if you were considering retaining our company, you should speak with our clients. It's exhausting, it's a full-time job, on top of the full-time job you may already have. 
But if you want the shortest sentence and the most favorable institution, all of the, the buzzwords that I know all of you are after, RDAP, Second Chance Act, I know that's what you're Googling. I know that's what you're looking for. You should be exhausted in getting there. And Judge Pearson said exactly that at sentencing. She also said sentencing videos are essential. In fact, we previewed a sentencing video prior to our presentation. And since the 22nd of June, it's now July 6th, we're working on four new sentencing videos for clients. I'm going to be traveling um, throughout Southern California. A colleague on my team is going to be leaving the state to interview and film clients for the day. We are going to create these compelling sentencing videos that will augment the narrative. And Judge Pearson said, sentencing videos are the wave of the future. Every, everyone should have one. And a lawyer in the audience said, but my judge won't watch it. I've never done it before. Judge Pearson said, uh, if you don't think your judge will watch it, show it anyway, because in time it's going to be the norm. Now, your lawyer may be against a narrative. Your lawyer may be against a sentencing video. If they say they don't want to do it because they have never done it before, you've got to have the skill set to ask the right questions, the follow-up questions. Just because they've never done it before, does that mean it's the, the right reason? Offer some specifics. Ask the right questions to determine why it might not be in your interest. Is it potentially fees the law firm would rather collect? Are there specific comments that the judge may have said in the past that would preclude you from a narrative or a video? For example, I know a video that would look like a Hollywood production could be off-putting to a judge because the judge may think you're a rich guy trying to buy yourself out of jail. Well, it's got to be done strategically. It's mostly photos. It's, it just takes time. You're telling a, a story through video. So I'm proud to be working on a number of videos and have brought someone onto our team to help uh, to help move this process forward. Uh, and wrapping up with, with Judge Pearson on stage with her, it was very affirming to hear her applaud our work in front of so many lawyers and to say that it matters, to say that defendants can take matters into their own hands and convince and persuade a judge, presuming they put in the work. And I'll close with something that I asked her on stage. I said, Judge Pearson, is it is it true? I said, Judge Pearson, I've worked with a lot of people who have had privilege, like me, that went to really great schools, that had a lot of opportunities in life, a lot of privilege, and sometimes in a narrative, they're afraid to open up about their background and the privileges they had and how much money they had and how much success they had because it could persuade a judge, they think, to, to unnecessarily punish them by saying, the judge could say to them at sentencing, you had opportunities that others in my courtroom didn't have, and some judges have said that. And I said, should defendants be scared? And she said, you, I need to know everything, Justin. I need to know everything about the defendant. And she said, Justin, let me make this point. Even if a defendant had privilege and opportunity, there were some fractures along the way that could have compelled them to break the law. What are those fractures? And it was so interesting to hear. I thought about some of the fractures in my life, despite the privilege and opportunity. I thought, wow, in 1993, my parents got divorced, and there was the Rodney King riots that destroyed you know, my father's business, and he went through some financial hardships, and I was kind of regretting that I went to USC because I didn't think my parents could afford it, and I, I took out scholar, I didn't have the scholarship enough from baseball, and, and then I was so driven to make money to take... So I thought about some of these fractures, maybe none of the fractures compared to what you've had in your life. You may listen to this and say, my God, this kid's had no fractures. And it's like, they're fractures to me. It's a big deal to me. It's like when I used to tell my partner, Michael Santos, you must laugh at me that I get 18 months, you're doing 45 years. He'd say, Justin, every experience is, 18 months is significant for you. It's severe and I totally understand it. So my fractures are my own. The point is they have to be articulated to a judge, whatever they may be. And that's how I'll close. For us to help you, if you're going to opt in to get our resources, just don't read them. Implement what we teach you. Take the time to express to a judge through a video, through a narrative, who you are, what you've learned, why you're working to build a new record, and how you'll become better through this experience. And if you do, as I took from my notes while on stage with Judge Pearson, you will leave that sentencing hearing utterly exhausted, drained, knowing there's nothing more you could have done to prepare. And that's, I think, dignity. And self-esteem comes from knowing you've worked your ass off on days you'd rather do anything else. And that's how I'll close. Was I rusty? I think I was a little rusty. My first video in six weeks. But I only do one takes as a policy. I'm not doing it again. Um, I'm going to stop this, do a quick edit, post it. And I hope to get back to doing videos more regularly. Thank you all for your time. Oh, lastly, if you'd like to see an example of a sentencing video, uh, send an email to jp at whitecollaradvice.com. I will send you an example of a sentencing video in case it's something you want to uh, do as you approach your sentencing. Be well, subscribe, comment, like, 
uh, back soon. Bye-bye.